Earlier this year, I learned that SpaceX CEO Elon Musk was planning to land people on Mars for only $500,000 per person. I released a video in which I made some educated guesses based on all the available information. In summary, I predicted that either the Vasimir rocket, whose inventor had recently teamed up with SpaceX, would send the Dragon to Mars with its hydrogen fuel tanks protecting the crew from the radiation, or the Falcon 20, with its 140 ton lifting capacity, would lift the Dragon, living quarters, and radiation shelter module into orbit, and a Falcon 20 Heavy would lift the TransMars injection booster. For the landing phase, I predicted that the Dragon would make a propulsive landing onto the surface, and the crews would stay in an underground shelter. For getting back off the surface, I predicted that they would land near a cargo vessel landed there in advance of all the return fuel, or that they would convert the Martian methane to fuel. Well, in the seven months since I made that video, Elon Musk appeared as the guest of honour at the Royal Astronomical Society in London, where he gave a 15-minute talk, followed by nearly an hour of question and answers. Although he didn't reveal the overall strategy, Musk did make some rather interesting revelations which help give us the picture. First and foremost, Musk said that the rocket needed to launch the Mars mission must be larger than the Falcon 9 Heavy. We're doing things like the Falcon Heavy, uh, which will have two additional side boosters, two, two, two additional first stages of side boosters, and, uh, and with the upgraded thrust of Falcon 9, that will take it to uh, about maybe 60% to 65% of the thrust of a Saturn V, just, just to put it into perspective. So, uh, in, you know, maybe around the four and a half million pound thrust level, um, which is about twice as powerful as any other rocket on Earth. Uh, but, but I think, I think obviously, if you want to go to Mars, you need something even, you know, substantially bigger than that. So, uh, some, some future vehicle, I think, would, would, would probably aim to be um, quite a bit bigger than that. The only rockets bigger than the Falcon 9 Heavy that SpaceX has so far proposed are the Falcon 10, the Falcon 10 Heavy, and the Falcon 20. Unfortunately, Musk didn't say what the payload to Mars would be, and thus didn't specify which of these three rockets he would use. Or maybe, Musk will be using something even larger than the Falcon 20. Last October, it was announced that SpaceX is designing a new engine for a new rocket, called MCT. SpaceX President Gwen Shotwell was quoted as saying that the new rocket could lift between 150 tons to a whopping 200 tons to Earth orbit, well above the lifting capacity of the Falcon 20. Since then, it has been rumoured that the new engine for this new rocket would be the Raptor, SpaceX's upcoming LOX methane engine. Musk was questioned along these lines in an exclusive interview he gave to the Royal Astronomical Society prior to his lecture. You've also dropped hints of a, a more powerful uh, rocket engine under development. Um, Raptor or MCT people seem to be talking about. Uh, what does MCT yeah. stand for and, and uh, is, is, that, is that right? Um, you know, yeah, I mean, every, kind of, every now and again I sort of just throw something out just for fun. Um, and um, the, the, uh, I can confirm that the name of the engine is Raptor. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I'd like to announce maybe some details about the engine next year. Okay. Um, but um, perhaps uh, what's even more interesting is the spaceship that that's attached to. Okay. And, and does the M and MCT stand for anything to do with Mars or Martian or? <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to leave a little, you know, don't you show a little leg, not all of it. Okay. <laughs> Regardless of whether or not the MCT will be part of SpaceX's Mars mission, later in his Q&A session, Musk went on to reveal that they plan to convert the Martian carbon dioxide and water into methane, which they will use as the return propellants. And you need to use a source propellant, uh, for a source fuel I should say, because liquid, liquid oxygen is incredibly cheap. Um, uh, to, liquid oxygen is like 2-3% to three percent a pound. Um, so really it comes down to the fuel and the pressure it. And, um, well, the cheapest fuel is methane. So, so it's, it's going to be methane. <laughs> um, and also the nice thing about methane is that uh, you can create it on Mars. Um, because Mars has a CO2 atmosphere and there's a lot of water ice in the soil. And conceivably, I mean, you might be able to extract water vapor from the atmosphere, but that may be harder than simply mining water. Um, 
But then with water, you've got H2O with, uh, plus CO2 that gives you CH4 plus O2, and um, bingo, you can uh, replenish propellant. This is quite along the same lines as what I had envisioned. Only my theory had the astronauts convert the Martian methane to monomethyl hydrazine, the fuel used in the Dragon's engines. Speaking of Dragon, it is not clear whether the Dragon spacecraft will be the craft that carries the astronauts to the surface of Mars, or if a different craft altogether will be used. You want, you want something that's pretty big, because if you're going to go spend a lot of months in it, it can't be the size of a money van. Uh, you know, around, around trip to Mars, uh, with six months there, 18 months on the surface, six months back, um, two and a half years, you know, you, you want a little room. Um, I, I would shudder to think of doing that in Dragon. Um, <laughs> and you go, you'll, you'll come back bad, you know, if you come back. Um, so, uh, I think Dragon could be quite useful as a generalized science delivery platform for uh, anywhere in the solar system, because with propulsive landing, you could, um, th that, that's a generalized solution, so you could, you could uh, land on any li solid or liquid surface in the solar system. Um, and, um, and, and I think really enable a lot more science missions um, for a given budget if, if, the trans if getting there is taken care of. Uh, so, so that's why I, th I do think Dragon is, is going to be sort of useful in that respect, uh, apart from being able to carry cargo and people to Earth orbit uh, missions and you know, maybe some, some other missions too. Um, when I first saw this, I assumed he meant that the Dragon would travel to Mars, dragging the living quarters in tow for comfortable living during the coast phase of the voyage, and then undock and land on Mars, as per my theory. However, in a Space.com article covering this announcement, we find this statement. Musk also ruled out SpaceX's Dragon capsule, which the company is developing to ferry astronauts to and from Earth orbit, as the spacecraft that would land colonists on the Red Planet. When asked by Space.com what vehicle would be used, he said, I think you just land the entire thing. When asked if entire thing is the huge new reusable rocket, which is rumoured to bear the acronymic name MCT, short for Mass Cargo Transport or Mars Colony Transport, Musk said, maybe. I could not find this statement anywhere in the video, not even during the part when Musk was answering the questions raised by the Space.com reporter. However, Elon Musk himself posted a link to this article on his Twitter account, so I assume this statement is accurate. So, could it be that SpaceX are planning not a Mars orbit rendezvous approach, but a direct ascent approach to Mars? Possibly so. We know that SpaceX plans on taking rocket reusability to a whole new level by having the spent stages of their Falcon rockets make propulsive landings onto the Earth. While this is still a long way off, SpaceX has taken the first steps of this goal with their Grasshopper project. The Grasshopper has twice hovered vertically for a few seconds before making a perfect touchdown. While I feel that SpaceX's dreams of rocket reusability could very likely become reality, I have to say that the idea of sending a launch vehicle larger than the Falcon 20 all the way to Mars, landing it on Mars, and then launching it back to the Earth does sound far too difficult. By comparison, direct ascent missions to the moon were ruled out in the 1950s because the Nova rocket needed to launch the capsule on its direct trip to the moon and back would have been way too large. And that was just trying to send a capsule to the moon, never mind take the launcher with it. However, maybe this is inaccurate. After Musk's speech, it was speculated by some that MCT is not the super heavy rocket itself, but rather the upper stage. An Earth departure stage with a crew module for Mars transport and landing. Okay, but in that case, what's the new rocket that can lift up to 200 tons to Earth orbit? Or could the Mars payload be 200 tons? With so little to go on, it's far too early to conclude yay or nay, so we'll need to wait for SpaceX to officially reveal just what the MCT is and what it stands for. Interestingly though, the private group Mars One, one of SpaceX's customers, aims to send humans on a one-way trip to Mars. Their plan involves landing a series of unmanned dragons on the Martian surface with all the equipment needed to set up a permanent civilization, along with two robotic rovers to assemble everything in advance. 
In a scenario virtually identical to what I had theorized, the Mars One colonists would journey to Mars in a ship comprising of a living quarters for the coast phase and a dragon for the landing. The colonists would make a propulsive landing near the pre-assembled Mars base and quickly make use of it. Over the years, more and more equipment and astronauts would join them, adding to the ever-growing Mars colony. I'm not sure why the Mars One team proposes using the Dragon to land astronauts on Mars, while Musk would opt for a different craft. But I'll wait for the official unveiling. Finally, the most important matter. For radiation shelter, I proposed a spherical cabin 2 meters in diameter and surrounded by 2 meters of water. This would have a mass of 109 tons. Together with the Dragon and living quarters, this would be 131 tons. I had high hopes and great confidence that this would be SpaceX's strategy. But alas, this was not the case. In terms of shielding against, um, against a solar radiate, you know, sort of a solar storm, I think you, sometimes that problem is stated as you need you know, several meters of water you know, to shield yourself and, and, and then somebody does calculation for the volume of the sphere and that ends up being some enormous quantity of water. But you don't need to have that. You can just have a column of water pointed at the sun um, and make sure that you're mostly in front of that column um, and you should be okay. So, so I, think, I, think it'll be, I don't think it's a huge sh showstopper. It's certainly not a showstopper and, and, and we'll figure out ways to make it better and better over time. When I heard that, I felt literally crushed. Don't get me wrong, I have, and still have, a great level of respect and admiration for Elon Musk for all he has done. But it seems he has greatly underestimated the radiation shield requirement. One of the biggest misconceptions about the sun is the idea that solar flares are directional and as such you only need to shield one side of the craft and keep that sheltered area pointed at the sun. This isn't true. The sun has a magnetic field that fans out across the entire solar system. Solar particles tend to travel along the magnetic field lines and as such they are sent off in all directions. In fact, last January, the radiation from an X-class solar flare that was pointed away from the Earth was deflected at the Earth by the Sun's magnetic field. And this is not a unique case. It's been known to happen for decades. In fact, on page 254 of the book, Astronautical Engineering and Science, written in 1963 by various scientists at the Marshall Space Flight Center, we are told, Contrary to what might be expected, much of the radiation encountered in solar proton outbursts appears to reach the vicinity of the Earth in isotropic distribution, thus necessitating protection from all directions. And then we have cosmic rays, the radiation emitted from supernovas and other distant stars. On page 226 of Prospects for Interstellar Travel, we find this statement by astrophysicist John H. Malden. Cosmic particles are dangerous, come from all sides, and require at least two meters of solid shielding all around living organisms. Later in the Q&A session, Musk stated that as part of the Mars base, he plans on setting up transparent pressurized domes to grow plants in. He didn't say how he plans to protect astronauts from radiation whilst on the surface of Mars. Although his customers at Mars One have proposed bringing an inflatable habitat and covering it up with Martian soil. This would certainly offer protection on the surface, but like Musk, they too have underestimated the radiation shield requirements for the coast phase of the voyage. On their website we are told that the Mars One Transit Habitat Radiation Shelter will have at least 20 grams per square centimetre of shielding. Returning briefly to astronautical engineering and science, this chart shows that at 20 grams per square centimetre, the doses from these solar flares would be reduced to 9 rems or 90 rems, depending on the energies of these flares. On March 7, 2012, an X-class solar flare erupted and lasted for 20 hours. At 9 rems per hour, this would result in 180 rem, which is enough to cause vomiting and nausea. And at 90 rems per hour, the crew would receive more than three times the lethal dose for humans. Still, we have a long wait to go. Neither Elon Musk or Mars One plan on sending men to Mars for another 10 or 15 years. Hopefully, that will give them enough time to realize their mistake and rectify these problems. And I showed previously that lifting such a heavy shelter could be accomplished with the Falcon 20. So overall, while we still need to wait for more details, my predictions turned out to be quite similar to the SpaceX and Mars One strategies. 
SpaceX plans to use a rocket larger than the Falcon 9 to lift their Mars transfer vehicle, and plans on converting the Martian resources into return fuel. Meanwhile, Mars One plans to send the crew to Mars aboard a ship comprising of the Dragon and a module carrying the living quarters and shelter. The crews would touch down on Mars and the Dragon and be protected from radiation beneath the Martian soil. But if these missions are to become reality, it is imperative that both SpaceX and Mars One acknowledge the reality of the radiation environment and redesign their equipment accordingly. SpaceX's column of water must surround the entire shelter, not just one side of it. And Mars One must beef up their shelter from 20 grams per square centimetre to 200 grams per square centimetre.